this one because we, we, time's moving on and um, I, I, I'm sorry I could bore for Africa and England on, on my passion for this subject. Um, ocean cruising yachts, again, have specialities as we all know and rigs and sails and everything else are particularly relevant. So we're going to look at this very quickly and I'll push through. You know who I am. This is the man. If you were in Berthon, this is the guy who should be doing this now. Unfortunately, Robin couldn't be with us today. And he's the real deal. He knows about rigs. And this is the sort of person that you should be talking to in your refit as a person who can manage it all for you. There's my boat. Now, it's all preference. We've talked about catchers, schooners. I'm always disappointed more people don't have a schooner because that's a great rig configuration. And they're not popular for some reason nowadays. These even work. Catch junk rigs, sloops, any boat would be great. I do recommend Cutter. I think that's a great rig for blue water cruising. It gives you the options to follow one away and put that one out if a squall comes through, which you have to do quite quickly. And also, you can carry them in a goose wing sense, which we'll see a bit later on for proper downwind sailing. They come in all shapes and sizes. People do like these things. The only thing I've got against those is there's certain boats that have put them on. If you're sitting in a windy area, they whistle and make noises and all that sort of thing, and it always sounds as though there's a gale blowing, but they are great things to have, uh, there are lots of different types, that's a fairly robust one as you can see, this is a modern rig, and you see the spreaders are all swept back, there's a very simple rig, there's a sort of classic, what you call inline rig with all the three spreaders, there's one that's very different, it's got hardly any shrouds and everything holding it up, carbon and all the rest of it. But most people, I think, who buy a boat is going to have something that's fairly generic to this, which is a typical spar that goes on many boats that's a sloop. Three spreaders, two spreaders, one spreaders, and they're made by all the sort of manufacturers like Selden and everything else. You might even have a wooden boat. Wooden rigs are wonderful. They're great for crossing oceans. When you get to the other side, you find all those skills still in the Caribbean, all these wonderful people that can look after your rig. And I would say that a properly found boat with a good wooden rig is as good as any you'll find. Know your rigging. When you actually get your boat for the first time, amongst all the refit worries you've got, is to see if this rig is, in fact, good enough to stand up to the riggers that you're going to put it through. There are many types, as you can see. You've got, even in these sort of wire wound riggings, you've got different dimensions and types and fittings. And they are very diverse, as you can see. There's a tail end, for instance, that goes into a mast that's quite different to some. There's another one, how the whole rig is set up. There's one of our wonderful apprentices. We do have a full rigging shop here at Burfin. You can swage terminals, they can help you. You can see this different type here. All these parts need to be looked at really carefully. It's a major part. It's the engine that's going to get you there. You're not going to motor the Caribbean. You're going to require your rig and your sails to get you there. And here are all the types of fittings, and I point particularly this one here, which we're going to look at in a minute. This is one that hooks into the mast. Quite often on a modern rig you've got these. This is a very high-tech one, carbon. Some people will have a boat like that, but most cruising boats don't fit this type of thing. Uh, it's high-tech racing. But there are all these different parts, that, and each individual yacht will have different types. And the holding up the mast, there are lots of different ways of doing it. You can see that was the one I was talking about that hooks in. You've got tangs on there, there's a split backstay, there's the classic rig we were looking at, here's an adjustable backstay. And wooden boats have different types of things holding up. There's an interesting one, an adjustable backstay that you put in a, a handle and tie it up. You get runners, there's another fitting there. You've got lots of parts of the rig that are below deck, hidden away in lockers and so on, in certain styles. You need to know what you've got, what you're actually going to be dealing with if there's a problem on the rig. And they're held up by all these parts, like a furlex, this is a furler, that's an important integral part holding it up. Some have got backstays that have got rams on them that are hydraulic. Here's a boat with no backstay at all, it's just got running backstays. And here's one that's very basic, you can see it's going on to a, a, an adjustable there, and then there's just a couple of shackles that are all galvanised there. If you're going to have that looked at, have a look at it really carefully. Here's a classic normal rig with a backstay and a little ram that you can adjust the rig. And it's very important to have all these parts checked and looked at very carefully. Conventionally, masts are either stepped on the deck and, or they are stepped through the hull, as you'll see. And the actual position that you step the mast, that's terribly important that you look at that really carefully because that's an area of failure. If you get into big seas and the mast is bouncing around, if it jumps off that area there, that's where the real problems start and the mast will come down. 
And you can see here, this is pretty much a Heath Robinson arrangement. If you were buying this boat, you'd want to have that looked at really carefully because it is not original, I suspect. Somebody's put on a galvanized rig, which is a, an indication it's quite an old yacht because gold adenized rigs are, um, tend to be the older boats. And it's stepped in a funny way. It's got a sloping deck. That could be a point of failure. Here's a th typical through hull. So it's going through the hull and stepping down onto the keel or in the middle of the thing. You've got to seal this properly. This is a major area of leak when you're going downwind, or it's not perhaps as serious, but certainly going upwind when the rig's moving. So it needs a boot of some sort to seal the hole, basically. And you can see what it does. It goes through the cabin and can get in the way. Most yachts have got that designed quite carefully. On my boat, it's there. You can see it as a bulkhead, but it isn't bang in the middle like that. And that's a big consideration if you've got a yacht of that design. It's a wonderful thing to have your mast through because it's probably stronger in some respects, but it is well in the way. And it sits down on its step there on top of the keel. Tuning a rig. It's fairly easy to do, actually, if it's a simple rig. So don't be frightened of it. If any of you have got any sort of technical knowledge at all, you can adjust it. And there's a basic diagram, lower, upper, whatever. If you don't know about rigs, leave it to the expert. It's something that if you get it wrong and you tune it wrong, you might cause more trouble than it's worth. So if you get somebody expert looking at it before you do the transatlantic, once you get to the other side, have a look at it. But I'm sure most people who are in your position have some ability and knowledge, and it's worth having a few of these. Those are the basic tools. <laughs> There's nothing modern there. You just pliers, old bits of piece. I particularly like this um, mallet. This is your persuader, making a pin come out or something, grabbers and all the rest of it. Great bits of kit and you've got basic tools. Cats are different. I took two cats. That's not the slide I wanted. Cats are different. I took pussy cats around the world, and I'll just show you that. There's some junk on the boat. Two motorbikes we took with us, and the cat used to sleep there. What I meant to put was that. Cats are different animals. They're rigs, is what I'm talking about. We've got a wonderful catamaran here, and you'll see there's no backs there. Uh, you can see these diamond jumpers on catamarans. You can see there's a classic example of the triangulation. If you don't know about catamaran, there's no adjustment there. You can see there's no hydraulic ram. It's a fixed rig, and they're quite specialized. Unless you know about that, I wouldn't fiddle with them too much. Get your experts to set them up for you. But they're great boats, catamarans. There are more and more of them doing the arc. And uh, you can see, because of that, they've got all these jumpers and everything. They all have to be tensioned correctly for the boat to be actually in tune. Surveyors, when they come and look at your rig for the first time, they normally limit their inspection and comments to deck level, but they will advise buyers to obtain expert advice if they think it necessary. It can be done with a mast in situ, visual inspection of standing rigging, they'll give you a written report, they'll find all the things, and then there's NDT. Anyone know what NDT stands for? Yes, exactly. And that means they just scan it and they have a look at it. And it's a very good thing to do if you've got a big boat, have a look at these various things. Damage, crevice corrosion, dents, compressions, permanent bends, loose fittings, broken wire strands. I'll quickly run some, through some of these. There's a little crack there, do you see? That wire is broken. There's another one there with a crack. These are all sorts of things that could be major failures and they're not easy to see. You have to really look hard and have a look at these areas. There was a piece of rigging that was in fact very, very poor condition, but it was hidden by the fitting that it was in. There's some corrosion that was on a fitting that was on the mast. It was used with a different material, obviously sat there for some years, and it's created a great weakness in the mast. There's another breakage. These sometimes are tucked in there. You can't see them. Look at that mast step. That's down below on the keel, and that is really corroded and de degraded. And unless they're taken that rig out, you might not have seen that. It was hidden in there. So that's why it's so important to look at these things. If you got into a big sea, that might have broken off and fallen apart. And there's all these parts underneath that you need to get into lockers, have a look at the chain plate areas. There is one of those hook-in fittings. Do you see the crack there? You're not going to see that when that rigs up. It's tucked in and hidden away. You've got to get that down and have a look at it. And this is all to do with how new and how old boat is, how much risk factor you're prepared to take. Always have a really good rig saver. As my my uh, understanding of it is you've got to try and get across safely. And if you miss this out at your survey, your refit, your preparations, you're going to get into trouble. Especially if you've got something funny like that. I saw that on a rig and I thought, what was that? It's a, it's a hole that's been drilled there. That could easily be 
a weakness in the mast. So make sure with the rig manufacturer that it's okay to have a hole there. There's a fitting that goes onto the deck. It looks great, it looks fine. There's quite a lot of sort of colouring. You can't see that that clearly. There's a bit of rust there. And the pin is not properly in. We were talking about this yesterday. That pin is absolutely straight. With a little bit of sailing, that will work loose, but then you, any, if you're unlucky and it'll drop out, then that whole rig could fall down because of that. All these little things that will be looked at. A rig report will highlight any defects. You can actually do massive repairs to rigs. This is obviously one that's broken. I wouldn't believe that that's a normal fitting, but you can repair it very successfully, and a real expert rigger will help you do that. That's obviously quite a powerful hydro. And at some stage, it's probably pulled out and they've damaged it or had a bad jibe or something. And so they put this strengthening plate in. So that shows you to the limit that you can repair all this stuff. Tops of masts. Look at this one here. What a bag of nails that is. It's got all sorts of bits on it and all the rest of it. I'd look at that really carefully, that rig. Um, tops of masts. You can't see these easily. It's best when it's down. Look at the angle that that's going in there. That's absolutely chapter book for a snarl on this halyard here. So when you're furling your sail, what happens, because that's sticking out quite a long way in a funny angle, it might hook on that and then take it round with it. The next thing is you break everything because it's jammed in there. That's a nice angle, isn't it? Going straight in. All those sort of things you need to look at. Tops of rigs. There's a wooden mast. You can see some wooden masts have got very little room and everything's hanging outside. Perfectly okay, but this is your archetypal modern rig. Dry colour at the top, Windex, radio aerial and a wind and, and, and a furling situation that's a, a classic what I call normal 45 46 footer even down to a 30 footer so you're going to replace this stuff well obviously you do if it's badly worn failed I've only changed one shroud on my boat it was so well built in that generation the stainless on that generation was very good um, I changed one but if known history dictates do something, upgrading or whatever. I changed all my halyards. Every rope in the mast was changed because they were too old. I didn't want main halyards breaking and have to go up the top of the rig to get it and recover it. I would suggest lights as well. Not all boats have lights and it's a preference. The only reason is, is that when you do go offshore, I found that it gets really dark in the Caribbean sometimes. And when we're up the front changing head sills, also, it's a safety thing. If you get near a ship, you put your spreader lights on, they can see your sails, and it's a wonderful visual for somebody who hasn't perhaps spotted where you are. Because a boat is a very tiny thing in a vast ocean. And if there's a ship bearing down on you, stick on all your spreader lights and your sails light up, they'll soon see you. You see the chap there just fitting one. Going up the rig. What do we think of this chair here? Between the two, which would you prefer? One on the right, yes. That's perfectly fine. It is a good one. But you, I would suggest if you're going to have a bosun's chair like that, have a decent safety harness that's attached somehow. You'll sit in that one and not fall out. Very easy to fall out of a chair like that. There's the best chair. I like those. Comfortable. It's got this piece here, which is a down part, which you can actually control somebody. Because you can imagine if a boat you're going along and it's actually healing, if you lose contact with the rig, you're going to swing right out away from the boat. Now, people do this sometimes by just having a little attachment here against the halyard that's there. But if you're going to control somebody, have the line attached there going to the dock. Because it means that if he gets stuck for anything, you can pull him down as well. Keep him under control. You can see this guy's got two, uh, two sorry, halyards going up. He's actually got them on the actual shackles. I'm not that keen on that, and I think most of us know this. Put your actual bowling in there and put the shackle on somewhere else. But it's a lovely chair, that. And particularly if you're going up for any length of time, it's very comfortable and you can carry all sorts of bits in the side of it. Top climbers, some people like these. They do work very well. And you can see when you get to the top of the rig, you can stand up and look over the top. My chair, I can't. I have to fiddle faddle from a funny angle. So these are great bits of kit that you can stand up and look. You can see he's well strapped on. And you can go up by yourself as well, which is a big advantage. So that's a preference. Look at this one. It's an interesting one. You put it up the actual slot and you've got loads of steps to go up. I don't know if they work. I've never tried one, but I thought it was an interesting idea. Here's a guy working well. He's got these little foot straps to control. He's obviously doing something to spreader, protecting it or whatever. I love these buckets. When you go up a thing, it's not hard. It's soft. That doesn't break anything like your, your lights for a start. You always forget something. Whenever I go up a rig, I've forgotten the tool. You send the bucket down rather than go down yourself. And they put it in the bucket and they send it back up to you. Be 
she's safe. Look at this girl, she's tapped on, she's up there. She's probably not doing any work, she's taking a photograph maybe. Here's a young boy, he's got one of those chairs with no harness, he's got bare feet. I think that's dangerous, I wouldn't like to do that. This is fun. I wouldn't recommend sailing along and putting your children out there, but it is a laugh, so you're out to have fun. Don't be frightened of the rig. You need to be slightly physically capable to go up. Once you're up there, the view is fantastic. And I'm lucky, like um, Dan, he takes it up on a powered winch. I've got powered winches. Putting somebody up a rig like that is a real struggle. So think about that. That's a wonderful solution he came up with there. Taking it to the actual windlass is great. And if you've got a big boat, communication. You lose communication with someone very quickly. And if you've got a small radio with an earpiece and all the rest of it, I often carry that with the boat when I'm up the front because Anne Louise is by the wheel and I'm up the bow. We have little radios so we can communicate. Great thing to have when you're up a rig. People can hear what you're saying and talk to you. Quickly running through this, downwind sailplanes, poles, twin poles and all the rest of it. That's nice, isn't it? Off he goes downwind, having a lovely time sailing. Very stable and wonderful. There's my boat, we saw that photograph earlier. I've set that whole thing up on a downwind plan. I've got my pole out, that's my big headsail there. You can see my staysails there the other way. Full main. Uh, this is something I added to the boat. I added a stack pack, which I absolutely love, because it means if you drop the sail, you've got all that baggage that's left over, strapped in without having to put on all sorts of reefing lines. And she's bowling along really comfortably, really stable. This is a wonderful downwind arrangement. I could actually sail that up as high as 100, maybe a, perhaps realistic, 110 degrees up, meaning I can come up big angles. And she sails virtually downwind. I can go 175 without worrying about a jibe. And talking about a jibe, you can't really see it that well. That's my donkey, as I call it. This is a preventer that's holding it. There it is there, sorry. It's attaching to the boom and it's tied down to a strong point. So if I did get into a jibe situation, that will not come whistling across. There are lots of mechanisms. You've probably seen them on the market. Slows the boat, uh, the boom crossing the, the boat. They're very good. But I've got a very basic thing I call a donkey, which is a, is a handy billy. It goes on there. The pole. Here's a conventional boat. Staying the pole, it's a real pain for this guy because he's got it. It's too long for where he wants to put it. He doesn't want it there because he's got a narrow side there. This works wonderfully. It's lying there. My favourite, which I've got on my boat, it's not my boat, but this is a pole that's up there. That's a very popular place to carry a pole. And it's an issue you need to think about when you're preparing your yacht. The reason I like it so much is one person can deploy it really easily and really safely. The inner end slides down like that. You attach it to there. And as you drop it down, it goes to the end of the, the actual uh, uh, clue, and the person back in the cockpit is pulling on the sheet. And it's a wonderful, easy method of deploying a pole. Because it's quite daunting. If, you, if you've never raced with spinnakers and all the rest of it, first time you use a pole, you might think, oh, I don't want to do that. It's a brilliant thing. The reason you do that is it controls the sail, and it doesn't flop around all over the place. So you want a pole if you're going to do downwind sailing. And here are lots of different configurations. And you can see what I mean about a stack pack. This guy, he sailed miles. It's a very small amount of sail here because he's obviously been in a lot of wind. Wouldn't be that happy carrying it that far away. I'd like that pole slightly further forward. But it's brilliant. He's probably done thousands of miles downwind like this, no problem at all. There's someone with twin head poles. And you can see here again, the mainsail's all a bit sort of hanging about. You've got to try and control it because if you get into wind, that's going to be a problem. Here's another trick. You can see here, this guy's carrying it loose luffed. So he's got his main furling sail there. This is obviously another sail he carries, but it's not actually attached. Now you always carry that sail to weather. That's this little secret for you, because they fly very well like a spinnaker. So this one sets nicely, and it's very balanced. I think he's probably got a pole there, I think. So that's a wonderful thing. He's not carrying a mainsail. I found not carrying a mainsail increased the roll in my boat. It might not in yours, but I found I needed some mainsail, even if it was very windy, just to stabilise the boat as it went downwind. There are many ways to skin a cat. Look at this guy, he's got a lovely arrangement. Cutter rig, he can put more sail up. He's only going on a headsail. Here's someone sailing on a spinnaker only. Again, the only thing to worry about on that is stability and getting it down. If the wind really pipes up, it's lovely having a mainsail up there to hide it behind. So I've seen people cross the Atlantic just for the spinnaker. And bear in mind, you're not going to go downwind all the time. Changing from this sort of configuration to going slightly upwind, which happens on all crossings, you'll find you'll go upwind at some stage. Not totally upwind, but you'll have angles. The ease of going from that to downwind is the wonderful thing. And there's a wonderful solution. 
person carrying an asymmetric sail, not quite as deep as this guy with a spinnaker, obviously, but he's going along really well, and he's good, good angle downwind. There's an interesting one, look at that. He attached his pole to his dagger board, it's a catamaran. I wouldn't recommend that, but it obviously works for him. Brilliant bit of kit. You can see most catamarans, they have a lovely bowsprit there you can carry all sorts of things from. This is a brilliant little piece that, um, it's, you can get this at Sander Sails here. It's for people that can't tack the sail down low, and so what happens is that this particular edge of the sail drifts out there, drifts out there, and by putting a little tang around your furling headsail there, it keeps it pinned in, gives the sail a really good shape. And there's a nice boat sailing along under spinnaker. I hope you do use spinnakers. I mean, I don't, I don't, because it's, on my boat it requires eight people to fly the spinnaker. I, I actually just use white sails, and I find I can go dead downwind and fast enough for me. Hundreds of different versions, poles, jockey poles, it's all according to what you want. And there are brilliant products on the market, like these furlers here, all for downwind sailing. Have a good look at this, decide what suits you. If you want a spinnaker, it's so easy to fly a spinnaker these days, you've got all these wonderful cruising chutes and so on. Take your advice, I'm sure many of you are very experienced and you already decided what you want. Keep doing that. Mainsails, we talked about this. Brilliant boat, Nyad boat, in mass furling. My mainsail is like this, it's fully battened and it drops down. I like that, that's my preference. Here's the in furling we were talking about. Great. It does mean though, if you get into real problems, you can drop that. If that gets jammed in there, mostly out in a big breeze, you can't drop the sail, it won't come down. So that's the only difference I'd offer you, is that furling a sail like that, if it's right up and it's broken, you do still have the opportunity in most systems to drop it on the deck. And these are different conventions. Different people have different mainsail preferences. The main sheet position is vastly important. Here's a boat which is great probably for racing. You're sitting at your tiller. You've got a little traveler in the cockpit. When you're going off cruising long distances, that might become a bit of a pain. If the boat jibes, it knocks over your rum and coke, knocks into people, it's in the way, it's in the cockpit. I like this arrangement. It's at the back, out the way. Helmsman can control it. There's another arrangement. This is a Hansa, lovely arrangement there. And look, this is a modern Oceanus Beneteau. It's got it on a, on, a, on a little sort of bar above. Getting all the ropes out the cockpit when you're cruising is wonderful. So think of your systems, because I can tell you that would probably become quite oppressive on a long, long journey. Emergency inner four stays. I've got a lovely one that I can put on and off easily. It's another one to have if the four stay fails. Um, tensioning devices, stowing it. When you take it off, can you put it against the rig? so it doesn't damage the rig. It's a great thing to have. Hundreds of parts here, look. Jammers, the ways it comes down the mast. Are the jammers on the mast or are they back there? Look at these ones, they're all in a terrible mess. You need to get those sorted out. This is a great yacht, it's got all going away, out of sight. Runners like this, all the different arrangements you have. It takes a bit of time to get used to it. It took me probably a year to get everything in the right place where I was happy with it, where there was no chafe going on and all the rest of it. And these are all the different arrangements you have on the rig. Booms, are they hydraulic? Are they just uh, pieces of uh, tubular steel that are controlled by ropes? Uh, there's lots of different versions, as you can see. And you will choose your preferences, and you will have to look at all of these when you're doing your surveys and preparing the boat. Because one of the big things on a rig is chafe. We all know about chafe, and you don't really find out where it is until you really go sailing. And these are the obvious areas, ends of spreaders covered with chamois and things, uh, a particular piece like this. I put this in twice because I had one of these protectors on, I think, and it had a nasty burr on it, and I couldn't see it. And as the sail went through each time, it was catching on it, and eventually the sail tore. So go and have a good look at your chafe preventers as well to make sure that they're not causing trouble. There's a nice arrangement. There's a man marking the spreaders. Many, many uh, sails have got the spreader patches actually in the wrong place. So make sure they're marked. This guy here obviously has put them in the right place. And you'll find that when you're going downwind and the sail's fully out, it's against those spreaders for many thousands of miles. Plus, don't forget to mark first reef and second reef position as well. Correct. As that goes into the first reef, it's obviously in the wrong place. Um, there's a piece of, um, not canvas, what is it, chamois over a, over a fitting where a sail passes and that keeps the chafe to a minimum there. And there's a forward look on my boat. I actually completely replaced all these here. They were all a bit gnarly and horrible. And this is where your sheets go around. And all the times you tack, I wanted my sheets to be in good condition. One sheet on my boat costs 600 pounds. 
I didn't want them to break. And so I put on all this extra stuff and it was a step in the right direction. There's some extra bits there to hold the rig up. And runners, they, they can be a tremendous wear on the sail. When the sail's there, my one here, you can see is tied to the side. In fact, it normally is on that fitting there. And I tie it really tautly close into the rig. And I've covered it with a canvas because that was a real uh, area that damaged the boat. And there's the old bus. I eventually got her right in all the various areas. I found these in a skip. And that's one of the things that when you're refitting, man is a hunter-gatherer, you become a forager. And Louise used to embarrass me enormously. She sees a skip, she gets in it to see what's in it. And uh, you will find that when you're doing that. You know, there's so much free and available. One man's trash is another man's gold. And if you notice this marina here, it's quite posh. Throw away the ashtray, darling, it's full. And if you get in that skip there, you will find something. Every time I went to the swindle rig, I'd find something in the skip. I changed my chafe things. I got this little bit here. Do you see, this is where the sheets go over the line. And to protect my terribly expensive sheets, I actually found these are rope covers. And I put a little piece of flex, which you have electrical wiring in, and then wrapped it with canvas. And they sit there and they're tied on and it's brilliant. That's where the rope lies. It minimized all the different parts. Have your daily walk. You were hearing that from Dan. He was doing these inspections, all the rig, you know. Do a daily walk when you're crossing the Atlantic. It's great fun. Go around, check everything. Make it part of your day. Fill your day up with all these things. Rigging screws, pins, check a loft. Check deck gear, run out halyards, see all of this. Because this is what happens. This is my boat. Everyone thinks you get damage in wind. This is light air damage. The, the sail, banging backwards and forwards, you can't quite see it, but that's my fitting at the base of the uh, van kicker and it broke it and this was just purely caused by no wind at all quite an after sea i hadn't taken the main down it went bang 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 and it broke that area there it also broke this i had that happen to me on the way to the azores my fitting here because the mast was going bang 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 with no wind it broke that fitting eventually and i had to get some parts did the same to a, a, a one of my battens no wind at all again you're in the middle of the night you don't want to take it down. You're hoping the wind's going to come. So it went bang, bang, bang. Next thing in the morning. This is why you do your morning checks. You look up the rig, see it's all still there. And that was sticking out the end. So we had to bring the sail down, repair it, get it back together. And you can see what it did to this main. It completely delaminated my main. Just by banging and banging. And I had to get a new main eventually. Handy Billy. These things here, you can't see the rope. But basically, I've got six different sizes of these on a boat. And basically, this saved me when I lost one of my hydraulic backstays. I had twin backstays with hydraulic rams. One of the rams failed. I took the ram off. Mast didn't fall down because I had two halyards. Oh, sorry, two backstays. And I put this there in place of it. And so it was attached to the bottom of the shroud, down to the deck fitting, and to that winch there. And just by tightening up, that became a really good backstay. And I've even got little diddy ones. We were talking about passerelles. I bought that at the Southampton Boat Show the last day for 200 quid not 6,000 pounds or whatever they can cost. And I made these little um, handy billies because you really need to tension this. Number of people I saw going down a plank that's all wobbly with all their washing and all their supplies and everything, dropping them in. I love having a passerelle. And this is in Guadeloupe and you need a passerelle in Guadeloupe because it's stern too and all the rest of it. Passerelle's a great bit of kit. Halids and sheets, all these are very straightforward. I won't dally on this, spares to carry, disaster. This is what we're trying to avoid, isn't it? And it does happen, sadly. Now, that is very rare, I promise you. If you do your work and you get your rig sorted out and you're confident in it, losing your rig is very, very unhappy when you're miles and miles from land. So you're trying to avoid it. And it, I've lost one rig. I've done 250,000 log miles. One rig fell down. And we were told by the the rigging guy that was sailing with us, we had a compress, compression in one of the spreaders, he said, this rig will fall down, and it did. And so, we didn't take his advice. So if you do your checks and all the rest of it, this will not happen to you. But you can be dead unlucky. I'm sure you've all seen that one. This is a real incident in Cape Town. Big whale came up, he was motoring amongst them, and the whale jumped up in the air because it had a baby and landed on the boat. And it left about four tons of blubber on the deck. And you can have an unlucky accident and lose your rig. That's why I'm saying you can do all the checks in the world. Fate will play against you. But I put this in. This is a very interesting thing. I was in Guadeloupe and one of these boats turned up. It had been abandoned. This poor guy here in this Bavaria lost his rudder. 
He felt he couldn't actually get there, so he got off the boat. That boat was abandoned probably four or five days out of Las Palmas. And it was spotted 60 days later by a ship just off Guadeloupe. And the insurers came to me and said, will you kindly go out and have a look for this boat? And I said, yes, would you like me to? And I rented an aircraft, flew out there, and we found her within the first pass. And there she was. So I trundled out in my big old bus, and we caught her just off Anguilla. And I took her into Anguilla. And then this boat, believe it or not, coming from the Cape Verde Islands, was spotted not far away. So I trundled off again. Same insurers. Both those boats came to the Caribbean with nobody on it. No sails. <laughs> So if you do lose your rig, you'll get there. It's just a matter of time. And it took them 60 to 90 days to get there, and they were in perfect condition. As you can see, this one had lost a bit of its mainsail and everything and all the rest of it. Um, the Frenchman was absolutely bereft. He thought he had a new boat coming. But Robert Holbrook and all these guys, they were too determined. And we presented this guy back with his boat, and he was so, so upset because he thought he had a new one. Anyway, that was a beautiful... Um, Grand Soleil, an older one, and it sold out of there for 12,000 US dollars. I've got to go, haven't I? Sorry, I'm finishing now. So it's disaster knot, they arrived, look. And if ever you learn a knot, that's the disaster knot. This is something, you all learn your uh, um, the bowlins and everything. This is a jury knot. It's a wonderful knot because it constricts onto the mast area there. There's the pace you attach your forestay, your shroud, and you've got two backstays. That's a wonderful knot to learn to, to put your rig back up. There's your tools. Bread knife for cutting the, uh, the, the, the halyards, lots of special tools. And look at those there. My rig, when it lost its backstay, it all came loose and all the chocks fell out. And I stuck in a pair of flip-flops to wedge the mast. They're still there, I can tell you. It's a wonderful one. <laughs> rig for paradise. There's Anne Louise lying in her thing. This is where you're going. And make sure you do all your rigging and arrive.